officially. My man. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I know you be sitting here talking about DJ life. You wanna know about my DJ life? How I maintain? Let's take a cheers first, a toast, man. A, a toast to the podcast, to your success, man. To yours too, brother. To the hard work and to the, at least take, even though this is a conversation with cameras in front of us, to the fact that we could sit down and pause, man, because I don't think we do that often. Uh, especially you and I, like. And every time we do it, it's it's some real, can we, can we cuss on Real ish. Real, yeah, no, you, real can, ish, you can curse. Yeah. Cheers, man. <laughs> Cheers, brother. Mm. Salud, salud. salud. Uh, how you feeling? Um, <clears throat> I take time with that answer because I, you know how when you ask that question, people say, like, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I'm it's more than that, man. I'm, uh, I'm blessed, I'm joyful, I'm thankful for the most simple shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, we talked, you know, briefly after your accident, you know what I'm saying? And just what matters most in life. And I think I'm at a place now where I appreciate those things. So everything else is icing on the cake, right? So like any type of success, or external win is the icing on the cake but for me everything that's internal everything that like the the growth within myself uh, my family my friends and seeing them flourish like that makes me feel good so how am i i'm very well man i'm very blessed how are you i'm also blessed man uh, you know you mentioned the accident it's like coming out of that situation i know we were talking about transparency and living in a transparent world and uh I was having a conversation with my mother because I didn't tell her that I got in an accident. Like I told my brothers and I put it on, on Instagram and everything, so. Did you hold it from her intentionally? Or? Yes, because she, she's the type of person that, that stresses easily and things tend to overwhelm her. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to compound any of that with what I went through, but I knew when I put it on social media, my family members who follow me, they were gonna tell her. Mm -hmm. And it took about a week and I was like, I, I was kind of waiting for that to get the call from her and but the call never came and I'm like all right I went to go see her for Thanksgiving and the first thing she says was you got an accident <laughs> and, and that was like the week the week after and I was like uh, uh yeah because when I wrote about it I, I I wrote a very detailed open letter you know it's so you, you know you saw it and I guess you know describing how the whole thing happened it freaked her out you know and uh she was like why do you put everything on social media why do you mm. tell everybody everything in your life i said mom mm. i said you know it wasn't more so about me we we're just talking about that trying to put it out for myself but if me putting out something and telling someone that this could have led to a bad situation mm -hmm. and that inspires someone to motivate somebody to make better decisions mm -hmm. then that's that's the purpose of that you know and that's all that's my thing with transparency it's not about telling my business but it's about trying to guide others, maybe people younger, maybe my peers, maybe somebody older, into showing, okay, I make mistakes too, just right, like right. you do, just like we all do, but maybe you don't have to make a mistake if it's, if it's, you know, if you don't have to, like if you can, yeah. you know, avoid it. Yeah, cause like, I mean, so I observe people all the time and I ra I'd much rather learn from somebody else's <laughs> error. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like when I was young, man, just, do the wrong thing after the wrong thing after the wrong thing. It's like, all right, this is the last time, God. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna do this anymore, and then you do it again. <laughs> and it's like, I would much rather learn from somebody else's mistake or experience, right? Um, I don't really believe in mistakes, but experience. And when I read that post, bro, I was telling you, like, the way that it impacted me, you know, felt like, you, first of all, you're an excellent writer. Cause he put me in the place of the scene and I felt the smoke and I heard the tire screech coming that. from you. That means a lot. Dang. <laughs> and, and when I put myself in there, I felt like I was there. So the end result made me have the same reflection you had, you know what I'm saying about life. And I think it's important to, you know, we celebrated a, a birthday this weekend and for one of my homies and it's very important to like, to mark time. And sometimes marking time is like, an accident, right? Like that thing will happen and it forces time to stop. If somebody dies, it forces time to stop and you're stuck. You're literally like, the world's moving and you're just stuck. You know, it's like, and when you're stuck, it's re that's where reality is. Like, that's where the realest shit is when you're still, when you're stuck. So instead of waiting to crash and like have these realizations, I would rather be stuck or still on my own terms. You know what I'm saying? 
and in, in, in reading that was able to allow me to to be still and like it was sobering. I was like, yo, look at like life is I need to live literally. I mean, live every day like your last is, last is such a cliche statement, but no, for real. You know, like, how do you do that? What does that look like living every day like your last day? Um, to me, it looks like this in the sense that it's like, yo, give love every situation, every everything that you're in. I mean, the, the crew y'all got, like, when I saw them, it was love, you know what I'm saying? Like, I told y'all what I told y'all. I love seeing us behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, working stuff out, like, giving people their flowers where they can smell them. I think that's extremely important, man, to let people know um, who they are, man. We forget sometimes. Yeah. I was trying to uh, remember wh where we met, how we met. Um, because I, no idea, bro. I, I knew of you, but at the time when I heard of you, I didn't know you went to FAMU. Same here. And then when I it's found out you went to FAMU, you. yeah, and then I was like, oh, he went to FAMU. Oh, well, that's FAMU Lee. Because like, you were doing, um, Joey would hire you for all the stuff always, yeah. like hella loyal. Yeah. And then, yeah, man, and I was like, yo, how did I, how did I not, how do I not, how did I not see this cat? You know what I'm saying? Like, and then once the pieces were put together, oh, he, he was the rapid and did, I was like, I remember him. Yeah. I still didn't put the pieces together, like when I see you on the scene and stuff, man. So I think it was maybe, I don't know, 2000 like officially? 11, 10? Like 2000, something like that. Yeah. Like officially like, yo, what's good, bro? Mm -hmm. And I never introduced myself. I was just like, we know each other from, this, from somehow, but FAMU connects us all, man. Yeah. FAMU's uh, is one of my favorite things to talk about, man. There's so many, there's so much there. It's, it's so much, it's like, it's like gumbo, man. And you just reach in, pick out so many delicious mm -hmm. and even sometimes nasty, <laughs> bad, you know, like things. But it's, it's FAMU's amazing, man. It connects us at, uh, in, a, in a way that's beyond, it's like, it's like family for real. Yeah, for real. Cause you, you come from, from, you were born in San Jose? Yeah, born in San Jose and raised between like San Jose and Oakland. Cause where's San, like, where San Jose in relation to Oakland and LA? It's like, so the Bay Area is, I don't know how to compare it. I've never been to Tampa Bay, but I think it's kind of similar where there's a bunch of cities that make up the Bay Area. So San Jose is about, from Oakland, 40, 30, 45 minutes. Okay, cause I know Vallejo's around there, Vallejo. Vallejo's like on the way to Sacramento, um, Richmond, Vallejo, um, oh, yeah, all that stuff, that's like, so the Bay's like, I don't know how many cities are in the Bay, maybe like 70 or 30 or something like that. It's a lot of small cities in between. So San Jose is the largest of the three major cities, San Jose, Oakland, San Francisco. And I'm between the two, man. So it's interesting being from there because San Jose is, it's not like culture, like in San Jose, like our culture. So it surprises me that I'm from there. It's a weird thing, right? It seems more like I'm from Oakland or something, but because Oakland's kind of comparable to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of culture, a lot of different, there's a bunch of Africans and you see everything out there. It's a lot of texture out there, right? And on that highway 101, like you saw all of these companies that you're seeing now, you saw, you saw them just like building Google. Um, I mean, Apple's out there. You see like every, anytime you're driving, you see that. So I think, I think that informed me in terms of, um, in terms of what I do now, right? Like, I think, I think your environment influences you in ways that you don't even think about. Yeah. How did you end up from San Jose, the Bay Area, to FAMU? My brother, man. Your brother went to FAMU? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came in, uh, when did he come in? 98, I think it was. And we dropped, we dropped him off. We went to Disney World. My mom and my brother flew to Disney World to celebrate his graduation and, like, see him off. I wanted to go to Hampton to do psychology because I want to do something different from like, I always want to set myself apart. I don't want to be in my brother's shadow. I want to just do my own thing. My whole family's like entrepreneurs. I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do psychology. I'm going to go to Hampton. They got a good program. I went on FAMU's campus to drop them off. I ain't that, that was, it was, it was a wrap, man. I never seen anything like that in my life. Yeah. He, he went in fall 98? Yeah. Yeah, that's when I went in too. I you know in. Remy? Remy Bariola? Maybe by face? Probably. Yeah, he, he, I mean, he used it, to make CDs like way before it was a thing. You know what he I'm had saying? like the CD tower, the burner towers. Yeah, way before he used to sell them on, on campus, man. And like, he probably saw me rapping on the set or yeah, something. Yeah, y'all probably could Yeah, it. damn, but, that's um, crazy. I fell in love with Fan, bro. Like that joint was like, yo, yo, I ain't, I'm, I'm from San Jose. Man. I've never seen that. So it's like a different world right in front of me. You know what I'm saying? Like this, this exists, this is real. 
beautiful black women, like every type of the rainbow as, as far as like, yo, this dude's in college, this dude with dreads, it, it, it enlightened me. I thought, I'm from California, you don't see cats with dreads in Cali like that. At that time, now you do. So I'm like, yo, these are some of the smartest cats. You know what I'm saying? Like, you would naturally stereotype the, the thing that you're not familiar with. So it taught me a lot about uh, us and a lot about myself, man. Is that where you develop the craft of writing or were you a writer I mean, you before you got there? Something that's really wild, I still have, and it's dated from like 2001, like stacks of stuff that I wrote, bro. Like I never wanted to be a writer. I never wanted to be an author. It was never a dream of mine. I never wanted to do a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now. I knew that my life would look a certain way, but it wasn't through this vehicle. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I landed somewhere that I knew I would get, but I didn't know it would be through writing. Right. And my mom was, a, um, before she retired, was a speech pathologist, speech therapist. And she would come home and give us all these aptitude tests. Mm -hmm. You know, she would test us for all this stuff. And for, at the time, I thought that was normal. I didn't know that like, you know, she was like being a great parent, you know what I'm saying? And, and really, uh, really believing and pushing her kids. But I developed a knack early for writing, man. And I would like English in, in high school and grade school and college, it was always like an easy A for me. It was like PE, you know, physical education, um, second nature. But it's just something that I, as I look back on my life, I was always doing. Like, I mean, I used to write like rhymes. I used to write like poetry. I will write like what's now called spoken word. I would just write how I feel. And I wouldn't do it often, but when I did it, it was actually good, but there was nothing for me to like, because the stuff that I found from 20 years ago, it's dope, bro. It's like, what, how the, who was this kid that was thinking this? Like imagine, I don't know if you had a rhyme book. I've had know? many. <laughs> do you have them from way back? I well, so I haven't written a rap down since 2006. Oh, word. so from 2006 to now, all my songs that you've heard, all my music, I do it in my head. Oh shit. Yeah, but prior to that, <laughs> and I, you know, and yeah, I, don't, I don't know how y'all do. I don't that. say that much because people, I, you know, they'd be like, oh, yeah, it sounds like a novelty. Thing. Exactly. Being honest, but it's right, really. That's just how my engineer, DJ Illusion, he'll tell you, like, I'll, he'll play the beat. I'll go in the corner. So I'll you, stand I, in the corner. And what does that? What does that look like? What does that process look like? How do you? It looks like. Like you're, you're the engineer, here's the producer, we're in the studio, they play the beat because they'll try to send me beats early. And I'm like, don't send me any beats because I'm not gonna write to it. I'm not gonna create to it until I'm in the studio. So whatever comes out is what's gonna happen. I'm that's not gonna that's, pre- That's amazing, man. How do you it's, tap it's, into that? Is it always on or how do you tap into there's that? A, so there's a movie called For Love of the Game with Kevin Costner. He's a baseball player and he's in his last game uh, thinking about retirement and he's a pitcher mm -hmm. and when he's on the mound as he gets ready to throw his pitch to the batter he says clear the mechanism and when he says it what it shows you is everything in the in the stadium quiets down mm -hmm. and it zones in on him and the batter and that's it so for me in the studio it's like it doesn't matter what's going on it's me and the beat I don't hear anything else I don't hear anyone else when I go, I literally have my nose damn near touching the wall and I'm mumbling to myself. People laugh at it, they joke at it, they put it on Instagram, they whatever, but I don't care because it's, that's how my creative process that's how you works. Tap in. And that's how, and that's what comes out of that is the music that you, that you heard. That's incredible, man. Do you have these stories already ready? You know what I'm saying? Sometimes, sometimes, no, sometimes. I would like the, the con, like, or, or, it's, it's interesting to be able to do that over time and say different things, right? I would love to, I'm not the best at remembering. I'll tell you, I'll tell you an a interesting thing. So I, I, there's, a, there's a producer a friend of mine, name is Izzy. Mm -hmm. He actually just got nominated for a Grammy for uh, uh, the song brother. Toast by Coffee. He produced Toast. Congratulations, and, brother. Yeah. Um, and he came in the studio one day, we were working on uh, my project Masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And uh, the record on there, Boy Meets World, he produced. So he comes, he, he plays about three or four different beats. And when he plays the beat for Boy Meets World, I had the lyrics for that when I was 23. Mm. But I never found the beat that captured the emotion of what I was saying. So that, is, it the, is it the melody that you're looking for? The, yeah, the, it was, it was, something was, specific that, that brings the out the emotion? It, yeah, because when I heard it, I was like instantly, oh, this is for Boy Meets World. Mm. Because I never released that song. I wrote it when I was 23, but I never found music that, that, that captured the emotion. But when he played that beat, 
and it was the last beat out of like three or four that he played, I knew instantly it was for that. It's interesting. And then my boy David Lynn, his homie, was there in the studio with us, so then he came up with the chorus. I said, I don't care what you do for the chorus, as long as you say in it somewhere, Boy Meets World. And then I let him figure out the rest of it. And so sometimes it happens that way, and then sometimes it just happens, you know, in the moment. The content, you know, the, the subject. Matter. Yeah, I think that's the same way with, with writing books. Like, I have probably like 17 books in my phone, but it's not... And when I say books, I don't mean flushed out. I mean, like, ideas and concepts, and it's like notes that are just crazy long over the course of years and time, but it's not in time yet. Right. Like, I need to feel within, like, culture, society when it's, when it's ready. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes, like, I go too far, like, in the future. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like, let's scale back that maybe too, you know what I'm saying? Too extreme. So that happens to where you collect stories from real life experiences. And it's also where a real life, real life experience can, like, inspire you on the spot. And you immediately got to, like, don't you have moments where you got to, like, you're like, Yo, I got to get this down now. If I'm having a conversation, I'll pull my phone out if something was said. that sparks something, like, excuse me. I gotta, no disrespect, I gotta, yeah, keep I gotta, talking, I gotta, but I gotta get this thing down. Right. Cause I feel like thoughts are like, sometimes man, when, 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 it's, when you're open, like how you said your process, and it's just, cause it doesn't stop. Normally what happens throughout the course of a day is this conversation, I'll have time to process it later, right? I may not be in the moment cause I'm thinking about this, but when you're like in the moment with something and things stop, you're, that's when thoughts and ideas are deposited into you and they go right out. There is no like holding it in and waiting. It's like straight from here to there. Yeah. And when that happens, sometimes you listen back like, did I, that was me that said that? Because right, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, you're just a, a vessel where this is being, that's the, it's that's being delivered through you. That's the word that I always use, man, vessel. It's yeah. like, I don't know how I do what I do, why I do it. I just know I'm a vessel from God. If God gave me a talent, hey, this is, I'm just the way that, that the talent comes out. I'm, I'm the same way. That's why I like, in the way that I wear it, I don't, I don't credit myself. I don't like, it's all glory to God with me. I don't, I don't. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress. I'm much better than I've been, but man, I've been, you know what I'm saying? I know myself, so I know who, I know what I come from. Mm -hmm. So I can't credit me and be like, I'm this great guy. Can I now? Yeah, I'm very, I'm very proud of myself. I'm, I, I am, I, I did a lot of, a lot of, a lot of internal work, but um, I think there's something to, you know, I think there's something to the idea of, even with that, I think there's something to the idea of not being kind of off, off topic, but not being too hard on yourself as you journey and, and grow through your process. You know what I'm saying? Like, even as we grow and we become better, there's still moments where you want to still be better. Yeah. It's like, yo, you're good. It's, you're, you're in process. Everything's going to be cool. The fact that you even desire to be good is enough in itself. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like when people tell me they'll, you know, they'll give me certain compliments or accolades on my DJing or my music or anything. and and and. Like like uh, my home Mahomet from the other episode, and she was like, "Yeah, you've been in the game a long time. That's why people they reach out to you for advice." Or, and I'm like, "But I, I I feel like I'm still trying to prove something to somebody, bro. Still, especially in this city in this DJ game here, it's like if I sit back and I think about it, yeah, I guess I, I have the respect that that I've earned, mm -hmm. but it doesn't always feel that way." So I'm always trying to do things to get more respect, or to be more appreciated. Because sometimes I could wake up and feel like, like nobody gives a shit about the effort and time and energy that I put into trying to be great with this craft. Mm -hmm. Whether it's from a DJ standpoint or a rap standpoint, you know? Not dumbing down what I'm doing lyrically, subject matter wise, it's like, literally as cliche as it sounds, trying to push the culture forward. Yeah. And with my little part, because that's all we're doing, we're all trying to push the culture forward with our efforts of our creativity from our talents for the bigger picture, which yeah. is the culture what we're doing. Yeah, man, um, there's a lot of parts to that. Um, first, you are, right? Like, it's important to note that in a body, there's several parts of a body and they're all equally effective. You know what I'm saying? Like, some people are ahead, some folks are the neck. You can't turn your head without the neck. Other than that, what's the neck do, right? It feels like it's just there, but it's doing a lot. I don't know if you ever had like an immobile body part, like a finger or something, you're like, damn, my pinky, I can't use it. Everything's messed up. You can't type, you can't pick up things right. Like every, every part matters, you know what I'm saying? And I think for me, man, like I went on a journey of exactly that, it not being enough. 
like damn am i trying to prove first it was trying to prove myself to others right like this guy anytime who went to fam who was a wild guy at fam you were a gentleman but like i had my way with women you know like and then it's like reconciling that so people who know me from back then this guy's coming out with an etiquette book how's this guy you know so i'm dealing with all that in my head how real is it it's not as big as i think it is it's a, it's a few people but the majority are proud of me right so i use that fuel and that negativity as a drive but what happens when like you finally get to a place you wanted to go and you're still looking for that negative fuel it's like you're searching for it because that's what you use like you need that you know how unhealthy that is i know that shit was unhealthy for me negativity is not fuel bro like negativity feeds the the ego the ego is a tricky weird thing that morphs into all kinds of stuff just in order to be served you know what i'm saying like it'll get you where you need to go and if you think you're better than it that's when it'll start talking to you and try to tell you ain't shit you know? <laughs> and it's like i helped you get here it's like so it egos we can't move off of ego we have to what i learned is that that process of being proud or trying to prove myself it had to be to me and when when i realized i was like Oh shoot, I'm just trying to prove myself to myself. Well, what is it that I'm insecure about that I need reassurance about? Like what is that? So I had to like go in the mirror and like dig and find all these things and it a lot of it came out in that book The Gray. You know, I went through a process writing that book and um decompressing after I wrote that was a crazy stage of like depression and just cuz I really? I took in so much energy from people. The book is ba- it's 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 based on based on some true stories, right? Whether it's mine, whether it's people I encounter, whether it's like people I encounter I have conversations with or not, cuz I can pick up on like people say vibes and energy, like I've been able to know who people are without them saying anything to me since I was a kid. I used to like look around at restaurants and see people and say like talk to my mom and be like, "Yo, I'm going to tell you their story, this couple right here." And I tell them, I don't know if I was right or not, but I'd be able to like I could just it's very difficult to pull a fast one on me because I could see you, you know what I'm saying, in a real way. Right. And when you take on all that energy, man, <laughs> it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. It, could be, it could be heavy. And so it took me a while to get out of that, but I was in this deep ravine. And in that ravine is dark, right? And you're trying to find your way out and you're panicking because it's like, yo, what the hell? Everything's, you look up like life's great. Everything's good. Why do, how, how, why do I feel like this? And how can I feel like this? Right. I mean, shouldn't this be like the the, this is like what it looks like when you know you do the American thing, go the American way, and you get your dreams done and all that. Like, why do I? Fi- so I had to figure out why. And a lot of people don't ask themselves why. They end up like they can't handle it, so they may like or do things that are just unhealthy in order to deal with it, right? To distract themselves. But I got in solitude and asked myself the difficult questions and went through that journey over the course of like a year and a half, two years, and. Um, was in that deep ravine until I realized that it was just me, me and God in there. And the entire time I was fighting myself. And then once I got sat still and I, I was like, you know what, it's, it's actually okay in there. I got to kind of like feel my way out to the light. And finally I saw the light, got out of it and I was way lighter. Like I wasn't the same person. I wasn't like, there's so much, I, I, the 90% of stuff I cared about, I didn't care about like in that way. I realized that it, it didn't have eternal implications and it was fleeting. And the 10% of things that I might have neglected, those are the most important things to me. And a lot of, I had to realize that those things are like right there in front of me. Friends, family, like all of that stuff, it's, it's all right there. Like anything outside of that in self, it starts here. But it's a journey to conquer self that a lot of us are afraid to go on because it's the most difficult thing in the world, you know? But for me, that's how I was able to, I've been up, I've gone down, and I've been up, but back on this, on this second ascension, much lighter load, way different perspective. I'm not trying to prove myself to anybody. I'm not even trying to prove myself to me. I'm just, I have a relationship with myself in a way that's like outside of myself. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I take care of myself in the, in the way that I try to take care of my son and my wife, like in that same nurturing way. Like imagine doing that to yourself, what you do for others. You know, are you kidding me? Imagine what that feels like. Right. How good of a person you are. To, imagine doing that to yourself. Yeah. And not in a selfish way, but in a lo- you, like you're doing it because you love you. You got to take care of you. Yeah, you have to. And that changes. Uh, it changes a lot. Just your perspective on a lot of things, man. Um, cuts out a lot of BS. It makes 
processes a lot more efficient because you're you're moving and navigating through life in a in a very meaningful intentional and purposeful way when i first came across you uh I remember you would always use the hashtag pleasantries. pleasantries. Yeah. What is what is the significance of pleasantries? Man, it was almost like a tongue in cheek kind of like, I'm coming at you on some real gentleman shit. You know what I'm saying? Like that's a I don't say ple I, I don't say pleasantries in real life. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's 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 like making a mockery of what etiquette and, and being a gentleman is supposed to be, but it's really delivering like these harsh realities and real truths and like real talk and these small nugget sound bites. These like easy digestible. Um, easily digestible content that is actually moving. So it's, it's fast and you can read it, you might laugh, but it's gonna get you to think, it's gonna get you to stop. Remember I said time stops? Yeah. It forces you to stop and whether you quickly look in the mirror or glance at it or stare, I'm gonna, it's gonna make you see yourself in some way, right? So the pleasantries is also to lighten the load. Like I'll say some real harsh <laughs> pleasantries. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Fix my bow tie or whatever. But it was really to just note that like, yo, a, man, a gentleman etiquette, it's not, this stuffy thing, it's just governing relationships. It's really about how you treat people, how you treat yourself. It doesn't have to be worn with a bow tie, etiquette. See, the thing, the, 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 the concept of etiquette and, and gentleman and the gentle woman, mm -hmm. um, I attach to that because I feel like our people as a culture have been going through this deconstruction mm -hmm. over the past 15 years or so, you know, from from a content standpoint, from the things, the, the, the imagery that gets put out, you know, uh, our representation on, on television and the social media, it's just like, it just feels that we're just in a, being represented or being shown in a different way than we used to be. Mm -hmm. Even for something as simple as, one day I Googled uh, black sitcoms of the 90s, mm -hmm. and it was like, Hanging with Mr. Cooper and Family Matters and, and, you know, Fresh Prince, you know, all these, you know, Sister to Sister, all these things that had positive representations of us on television that people got to watch every night of the week on right. a weekly basis. Right. And when you try to think about that today, it's like, well, what else besides Blackish has us in a positive light? On network TV? On network TV. On network. Well, I mean, that's a. I, it's a good point, but it's also like there's so many other options. Like I don't even watch network TV. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like there's we. I think we consume content um, vertically on our phones. We consume them. I mean, a lot of people are on Netflix, Hulu's, and Amazon Prime's, and all that. So um, I think there's this whole diversity initiative. I think they're trying that, but when you filter down the TV, man, like the content, there's so many mandates and so many like hoops you got to jump through in order to get something actually on TV that by the time you see it it's all watered down and that's why stuff that's usually on Netflix is way better or HBO or whatever way better more in depth than like real authentic than something you might see on a network you know channel because um, they have mandates you know that in order to filter through and get your program on a slot it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. lot yeah it's a lot so um it's not like it's not like the '90s on TV, but it's like the '90s every outside of TV in real life, fashion, music. You DJ the parties, like all the throwback nostalgic yeah. stuff. Um, and then we get that vibe. Like it's funny be getting. It's funny growing, because you get to see the same. You get to see yeah, stuff. Cycles. Yeah, it's like oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was a new thing. Like so now it's like you're just looking back and you're letting it download all the all the data. Like this is crazy. So. Okay, so you could almost predict what's going to happen next because you've seen it before. Um, so all these like younger millennials and Gen Zers who are fixated with the 90s and early 2000s, um, and even us, I think we're doing it because we were like sad. When nostalgia is in, like popping, anytime you see nostalgia become a trend or in vogue all across fashion, across music, across like um, events, um, themed events, across uh, television, across programming and film, um, when, it, when nostalgia is the, the, the main influence in culture, that means that we're sad. It means we're depressed. It means we're reaching back on, on good times because all that stuff reminds us of a time where shit was all right. And why are we, because the, the culture, look at, I mean, outside of what we're doing, the good thing about what happened in 2006, the, the, the presidential election, is, and I saw it after a while, at first I was upset and then I was like, this is gonna be the greatest era of art. Everybody needs to collect all art. Everybody needs to, all artists need to put out art, all creative need to, because this is going to be the most amazing 
collage in, in history because we're sad. And that's when the greatest <laughs> art is created. Yeah. And that's when we come together. Yeah. That's when we say to ourselves, like, you know what? A lot of this shit, 90% of this shit doesn't matter, but this 10% <laughs> actually yeah. does. Yeah. And when you focus in on that, that's when relationships strengthen. That's when like people band together. That's when um, conversations are being had offline. That's when plans are being made. That's when you see communities developing and growing up. That's when we see investment in our, in our communities and ourselves. You see like a shift, right? So it's a good thing when we thrive. We know how to, we know how to uh, move through a room full of vultures. We know how to, um, we know how to sustain, brother. That's who we that's are. What been doing. Yeah, that's it. That's what we, we do doing. it well. It looks good. It smells good. We wear it well. It, 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 it's packaged well. We know how to do that. So I don't know why we're so worried. We know who we are. And it takes times like this to realize that, you know? You had um, The Grey was, was the third book. Gentlewoman was the second, right? Yeah. And the first one was Variola S. Variola S. Contemporary S. Gentleman and Etiquette book. When you sat book. to write, well, did you know when you were writing that, like, okay, I'm here writing my first book? Is that Was that? It was overwhelming, man. Like, what was the page one, line one? I didn't know what the hell I was doing, brother. <laughs> if you were to be like, yo, recreate this table, I'm not going to give you any resources. Just figure it out. It's the same thing. Like, build this. Figure, what is this? Concrete? You know, like, just figure it out, man. Like, all right, so I got to, like, study tables. So let me look. All right, so it's... I wonder why this is designed this way. Is this for like lounge style seating in order to accompany more than one guest so it's more social, that's why it's long. And it, I gotta figure it out. I don't know, so I'm like, the way that I formatted the book, looking at it today, it's totally, it's not, it's not right according to like publishing the industry standards. You know, I did, a, I broke a lot of rules when I wrote that, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Cause I, I did it in a way that I didn't have, I'm an outsider, I'm not, I didn't wanna be a writer, I didn't study this stuff. Like I came in doing it the way that I wanted to do it intentionally so i broke this traditional barrier like the way that i came out with my books and stuff man you thought i was coming out with an album or about to go on tour or coming out with a movie or something but no nah, i'm this is a writer's doing all this shit like with promo ads that look like a ciroc diddy commercial you know what i'm saying like back in 2006 like it was it was about like doing things through my lens you know and that's kind of like why i do what i do i communicate i write i do all these things to to show you my perspective in order to shift yours. Because when you, when you see things differently, your life, <laughs> it changes exponentially. You know, so um, it was formatted all crazy. Like, when I look at it now, it took me, it was a hard time to read it. Because you don't, I mean, do you go back and listen to your music? Some, sometimes. It's hard sometimes, because especially when you spend time with something, you know it so well, it doesn't affect you. Right. You could predict the next, you know how the story ends, you know, so. Um, I don't really read my stuff, but when I go back, I used to cringe, but now I'm like, yeah, that's what's up, man, I'm glad. I would tell my 16-year-old self, like, yo, break the rules, like, do it your way, don't, don't conform, keep, keep being unique, man. Like, it's gonna take time for people to catch up, but, you know, keep on, like, showing up in spaces with, like, your sunglasses on at night, make people uncomfortable, like, <laughs> you know, like, do what you wanna do with, you ain't gotta justify it, it's just how you wanna move, you know what I'm saying? Like, dress how you wanna dress, do this, and I did that in a time, like, I, I, if you knew me, I got, a, I got a message from my homie, man, from uh, elementary school on Facebook or something. Yo, I'm proud of you, man. just want, want to say, uh, since fifth grade, fourth grade, like, I, you, same dude, the same guy. I've, I've heard that for some time to now I'm like, okay, because I, I, it takes, your relationships are reflections of you, right? It takes other people for you to see yourself. So when you go back in time, you ask other people, that they tell you things? It's like, oh, shit, I've been the same guy through and through. Showing up in spaces as, as myself before it was popular, before it was okay, before it was a trend, before it was pop culture, like, in, in bearing, like, getting the residue that comes with that, having to show up in a space where everyone is like, and, and I show up like me. Yeah. And I, I gotta somehow find the confidence to go in a place where I'm different, I'm unique, but I still gotta be me. So I've been navigating that my whole life. So Bariola-esque is what it looks like to everybody else. It was a, a guide for how to navigate society as yourself, man. Like again, being a gentleman doesn't look a certain way. You don't have to have on an, an outfit to be a gentleman, like a specific costume. It's not about that. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's about taking the idea of etiquette and allowing it to meet you where you are instead of imposing all of these rules and regulations on you. It's so weird you said that because I, I had a show uh, 
the other day, um, and you know, I'm in a, I'm in a, I guess you could say it's a group. Mm -hmm. uh, my partner, Lucian White, and I. It just sounds we, like a, that sounds like a rich name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lucian uh, White. So, you know, collectively, we call ourselves the gentlemen, you know, and yeah. so when, when we perform. That joint looks hella dope, bro. You know? Them joints you do look hella dope. Yeah, with the band, we got our band and everything, and, and uh, you know, a friend of mine said to me, because we did a show, and I went in a, in a polo sweatsuit. And, nor, you know, the last show we did, I went in damn near a tuxedo. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine it's commented to me, up. he was like, uh, he was like, yeah, the, sh the show was dope, but, you know, the way you were dressed, eh, you didn't, you didn't say gentleman. And, and then I thought to myself, I'm mm. like, but, but I'm still a gentleman. Just, cause, just because I don't have on a button-up shirt, that doesn't take away my etiquette, doesn't take away my morals, my values, my ethics. You know, I'm still a gentleman, you know, spiritually, like, you know, so I don't know why my attire... You know, he was like, nah, you should have, you should have wore this, da, da, da. and it, it kind of, it, it messed with me for a little bit, man. And I have a, t I have a chapter in Barry Les Kyle's title, Still a Gentleman, and it's like, I wrote that for me, you know what I'm saying? Like, and for you in that moment and for anybody else, it's like, yo, don't judge me based off of whatever I decide to present you. This is an extension of something else because people are layered, but there's so much more, right? It's your choice whether or not you're going to break this perceived barrier, whatever this, this means to you, yeah. and enter, but it's way more than meets the eye with me, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think I probably, when I meet people, I probably, well, not so much anymore, because I'm so authentic, like, on social media and stuff, so they, they probably get that energy, but, um, I mean, I could come with an intimidating look, or a curious look, or like, who is this guy? Like, there's so many things, I'm, I'm, I'm hyper aware of how I'm perceived, you know, because I, sometimes I use it as a tool, when I fly first class, I dress how I'm dressed now. I don't, I used to like, kind of like throw on a blazer or something. And I felt, I felt, it felt forced and I felt weird in the same way that it feels weird when I code switch, when I'm talking to somebody trying to, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I don't code switch anymore in any, in any, in any regard. Um, homie that did from Oakland, um, that did Black Panther. I don't know why his name is. is oh, Ryan Coogler. You've heard his interviews? He talks. Oh well, no, his his accent is yeah. He sounds yeah, like yeah. he sounds like Oakland. Yeah. He doesn't switch it up. Right. He's still Ryan Coogler. Yeah. That same guy sat in board meetings with like the like this. You got to know that that's the who you are is the sauce. That's your superpower. Right. Don't tuck that in. You know what I'm saying? Like display that at all times. That's your superpower. That's what people want. That's what attracts. That's your thing. That's gonna like get you to where you need to go. Like do that. Use that thing. So. Um, I'll dress how I dress and like I'll be sitting next to somebody, yo, you, are you are you in music? Are you <laughs> like I'm an author. Like nah, I'm on my way to I'm on my way to Harvard to um <laughs> I love that. <laughs> do a lecture about um this this thing I wrote. Oh what is it? I I pull them in. Yeah. It's a it's a oh it's a book, what's the name of it? And they get on Wi Fi, I'ma get it. And just kinda like pass me a compliment. Five minutes pass. Hey man, this this is it's a bestseller? This is really <laughs> there's three of them. Oh my god. So the conversation extends and I'm able to create a learning moment yeah. for somebody that, that judge me. It you in a different way. But I provide them the bait to do that. I don't come trying to fit in and be one of you, I come as myself yeah. to draw you in. There's some intrigue there. If somebody pops, if somebody does anything to agitate it or wants, they're curious about it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let them in so that they can be changed or the perspective could be changed, man. That's the whole point of it all. How, could, how do you go from writing the Bariola-esque to then The Gentle Woman, an etiquette book on women. Like, did you get any riffs or, or, or of course, resistance? Man. You know? Of course, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, first of all, I knew that that was the next iteration. Um, I didn't realize I was going to be doing a series, but I knew that I had spoke to men, like, now it's time to speak to women, I guess, right? Um, but I pushed it away because I didn't want to write it. It's too much of a responsibility, man. Like, I don't want to be the man saying, like, Entering the space, yeah, women should do this, women should do that, this is what's wrong, this is why you're here, this is why they that's not my language, it's not how I think, but I did have something to say, then I had to learn how to say it. So, it was a process of me, like in anything you, any art you do should change you as an artist. If your art doesn't move you, then it ain't gonna move nobody else. That's how I feel, that's my, my barometer, my gauge for like, all right, this is gonna do well, how does it move me? Did I cry when I wrote this? Did I like, this, this shit make me laugh? And like, for real? Am I like, yo, this is crazy. Those moments are, they'll travel through to other people as well. 
Um, so I had to learn the language of like speaking to women, right, in a patriarchal society where I'm already naturally tainted with like all kinds of like uh, toxic masculinity, even though I'm a gentleman. Like I'm from the Bay Area, you know, that, that's like pimp culture out there. It's, it's, it's saturated in the music. Like every artist in the Bay has, if you listen to their music, there's drips of patriarchy and I, like that's, that's, that's done rubbed off on me. Like I wore this cologne, like is this, is we all did the disrespect towards women, you know, even though you respect them, it's still this kind of like this, you know what I'm saying? It's this Bay, this Bay mentality. And I had to deconstruct that, which was eye opening. Like seeing the world through a woman's eye will tell about change perspective. That's cr that's like so a lot of my muses were like they were all across the board, but specifically black women, because as far as society goes, they're placed. They're like considered the lowest of the low in my eyes. They're the highest of the high. That's my mom, that's my wife, that's my daughter on the way, that's my sister, that's my, co beyond that, that's like, I'm not gonna just personalize it. It's every black woman, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need to go down, I don't need to, I tried to write what that is, you know what I'm saying? That's what gentlewoman is, it's like a, I see you, like I, I, I see you, I stepped in there and I took a look around and my eyes opened. So it's really extending that information to women, to reaffirm them, to affirm them. So if you believe that about yourself as a woman, it's to remind you as you navigate through the valley of the shadow of death, like, yo, you're still good. Don't grow weary and well doing. If you've never been taught this information, it's, it serves as, it serves as affirmation, right? Like, oh, I didn't know this about myself to be true. I didn't know. So it's a very affirming, loving, convicting, honest, funny, real, truthful, uh, piece of art man that like speaks to you like I'm talking to you it's not like you're reading it's like I'm sitting there talking to you but not to, like to your soul to that thing that's like <laughs> so if you can if you can do that move somebody in that way then your art will do well you know what I'm saying and that's what happened man it was that joint changed my whole life that book changed my life man I've, I've had the pleasure of DJing for the Exhibit Grey Tour Man. at the Gale Hotel a couple of years ago. Yep. I've seen you do it in LA. Uh, yes, you yes. Know, how did you connect with Steve Canal, Kenny Burns? Like, because, well, first of all, it's the book, Exhibit Grey. Mm -hmm. And then how That's do you a go great, from- yeah, You're good, man. That's a good ass segue. Because, <laughs> so- Because I really want to get to how you got, how that book became a, a, a tour. Like, cause you take it around the country and you know, yeah. like. So with the first books, I always toured universities and it was outside of my control. With the third one, I wanted to control every element of the, tour, of the entire experience, right? Um, and that's the thing about ownership. We're always screaming about ownership, ownership. It's not just, a, it's just, it's not just, of course it's financial, but it's also like you being able to dictate and have autonomy over your dreams and your creation, right? Um, so with the first books, again, I was, I was touring all over the place and like, you know, where I'm booked and I was always booked, but I wanted to create my own environment, man. Like, and it felt like, you know, my living room in college or something, the same feeling, right? Maybe not the same aesthetics, but that feeling of dope people, strangers. We used to do stuff at fam, man. We have like wine and cheese at the crib. it will be like a, a Sunday like it is. It's like, yo, what y'all want to do today? let's have a wine and cheese. And we just deck the whole place out like a little lounge and invite women and the homies over and we'll have like real conversation, you know, and there's like a VIP room in my room with a red light and cigars and like champagne bottles. And this is in college, you know, and like, it feels like something. There's like Dilla playing in the background and all kinds of other stuff. It just, it feels like, so I wanted to create that to create and facilitate uncomfortable conversations in a comfortable space. Ah, okay. And that's what the gray, that's what the gray is about. It's a relationship etiquette study that like, talks about why we're disconnected as a culture, as a community, as, as a society. So we've talked about men, talked about women. Now let's talk about us, right? Together, if the, if the man that read Burial-esque met the woman that read Gentlewoman, is everything supposed to be happily ever after? Mm. Nah, it's the gray area. Yeah. The gray is about all of those uncomfortable things, those traumas, real life that nobody talks about that everybody deals with the pink elephant in the room. So the tours, um, 
or an extension of the book. I can't, the book is so dense, so tragic, so depressing, so loving, so beautiful, so ugly that you feel all kinds of ways. You know what I'm saying? Like in the same way when I watched Queen Slim when it was over, I was like, I felt every emotion. You feel that. And for some people it's like, is there resolve? It doesn't end well. You know, how do I deal with this? Let's extend the conversation through the tour. Let's go around and get dope people and curate a dope vibe so they feel comfortable. But they're also, they're also leaving with something that's better than just like, I had a good time. You know, like, what, do people talk about the club when they go home or they just move on with their life? Right. I wanted something that people thought about when they went to bed, that moment right before they close their eyes when that everybody tries to avoid so they get to sleep faster. Some people take sleeping pills, some people will drink themselves, some people wear themselves out so they're super tired because they don't want to deal with that five minutes before they fall asleep and reality sets in. So I wanted to t occupy that time with the Grey Tour and those conversations. I want those five minutes. Give me five minutes. That's what the Grey Tour is. Like, it's all this, just give me five minutes because it's the same five minutes I'm gonna have in person if I'm talking to somebody. That, that, that being intentional, remember I talked about intentionality. Once you go around again, you, you learn, you learn something. Um, so, if you're thinking about Exhibit Gray and yourself and what happened there and how you felt and what you're gonna do differently and how you can change in those five minutes, then I'm good. So I wanted to tour over. We did it internationally, Toronto, Australia, um, all throughout the US. For two years, we toured that. And Steve Canal, man, like, he came out with the book, The Mind of a Winner. And there were parallels, like, right, there's the business side of the gray area and how to navigate that. And then there's just the personal real life side I thought it'd be dope to merge those worlds to provide greater scope, right? <clears throat> and to really, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to really kind of hit people at all angles, you know, like, I want everybody to be affected, man. I want everybody to take in the information and, and be moved by it. So Steve Canal was an, is an excellent, uh, excellent brother, man, a mentor of mine, turned business partner. Um, we have an agency, St. Miles Agency, uh, St. Miles. My son's name is Miles, his son's name is St. So it's like a, a legacy company um, where we now deal with like brands, corporations, um, and small businesses and like help, help them in all ways, <clears throat> marketing and advertising. Um, so it started, it started with Exhibit Gray and Exhibit Gray in Atlanta, we had Kenny Burns on one of the panels and it was uh, during the time when Nipsey first passed and we were gonna do Exhibit Gray in LA, but it was like LA temperature was kinda, everybody was mourning, man, we were sad. So I was like, damn, you know, we're gonna have like Karen Civil on the joint and um, it's gonna, gonna be really, really dope. I was like, damn, I wanted to do LA. Again, Exhibit Gray LA again, but it's such a sad time for us, man. I feel so conflicted. What can I contribute <clears throat> to move the culture to contribute to the culture that helps uplift us. So I said, all right, <clears throat> excuse me. A week out, I decided to switch it to Atlanta. I was like, how do we feel celebratory? When do we feel most celebratory? December 31st, New Year's Eve. Let's do New Year's in spring. Everybody gets dressed up. It's black excellence, it's tuxedos, it's, it's black dresses. Everybody feels good, they need a reason to party. We're gonna do New Year's in spring, exhibit gray in Atlanta. <clears throat> have a dope conversation, we did that. Sold out, amazing event. <clears throat> Everybody dressed up. Kenny Burns on the panel, having a conversation with the woman in the crowd. And she's just irate, man. She's just disagreeing with everything he's saying. She's married, PhD, but she had a chip on, I don't know what her thing was, she had some sort of a chip on her shoulder. So, she got up and left because she was so mad. Like, it, it hit a halt, she got up and left. Kenny hit Steve and I and was like, I think there's something there. So the thing I respect about Kenny, man, he sees like, somebody may take that, look at that moment and you know, personalize it and feel disrespected. He's like, there's something happening. There's, there's this more dissension. We should go on a tour. We should like go around talking to women. Um, rooms full of women, we're married men, all three of us, right? Like Kenny, Kenny, Steve and I have 30 years of marriage between us. So it's not us in a space of women like telling women what's wrong again. It's, it's, it's really, women talking amongst themselves, women asking us whatever they want to ask, a conversation um, with no residue of men in the room, because when men and women are in the room, it's, a, it's going to clash.
I've been doing that those panels for years. It's clashing. There's no real women, you know, like pair up with other women and have allies, and then men become defensive. So nothing is heard. When you provide a space for women to speak freely and honestly, first of all, it's amazing watching that happen. That's like that's like a sacred space that I'm honored to even be in because I'm like that's like being a kid and being like being in the uh, beauty shop with your mom. That's a privileged space because you get to hear like all these black women like that's like and imagine a black woman is married or that and they finally get to get together and have some real that's sacred bro <laughs> so to be in that space um and observe it you know we did five cities we're doing 20 and 2020 um and shout out to gravassier you know the, 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 our partners but um you know they're we're able to capture the real like the real texture and the real thoughts and the real data, not analytics from online, not this age and that ethnicity, but real time, real life people straight from their mouth, what's going on out there in every sense from married to divorced to widowed um, to single to dating. In Chicago, where we had our last stop, there was a 19 year old, a 21 year old uh, girl sitting there and Gen Z and there were three 70 year old women and everything in between, bro. And the 70 year old women called themselves the Golden Girls. They came out to just like the same reason the other woman came out, but you have that level and this level in the room of women sharing yeah. and, and hearing. So it's, it's amazing, I, like what's happening? We're, we're gonna you know, speak to men next for men only. And then we're gonna get men and women in the room together once the, the ground is fertile and you know, people are prepared to hear each other in a respectful way to see some change, man, because next three to five years if we don't do something the gap is gonna because women are growing yeah. they're investing in themselves they're going to wellness retreats we don't do that right. we're watching them do that watching. what's gonna happen when we just watch women grow and watch women rise right. what's gonna happen to the relationship between us if they're growing and we're watching you grow apart whether you're married whether you're single we just it's gonna get harder let's fix this before we talk about economic you know like economic um, efficiency and like before we talk about like ownership and all of that stuff we need to get our thing together before anything else otherwise all that other stuff isn't gonna work are you gonna bring that to Miami 100% to man of course yeah. of course yeah this city needs it Bro, I, like I'll tell you know markets. like this city you know cuz you know what you hear especially me being in the industry you know and and you know, dating and all of this shit. And, you know, you always hear, oh, it's so hard to date. I hear from women how it's so hard to date here. But, I hear, you know, we're hearing that in every market. I don't, but, I, cause to me, I'm like, all right, well. What are they saying? I understand, like, how a market can kind of dictate, you know, LA, New York, like how the dating scene is. I, I, I do get that. Um, I, think what, I think what we found is a lot of, it's a hard thing to swallow because I'm learning through this, this whole four women only tour, the, the issues, not all of them, but the issues that most, not just women, but people face are their own because they refuse to face their own issues. Mm. A lot of people are running from the mirror and it's like, oh shit, this, is, this thing's still here, this whole gray, I, we need to talk about the gray more, like people are still, yeah, people are still healing, man. Healing's a process. If somebody passes away 40 years ago, you might be good today and tomorrow, it's, it's like they just passed away. Healing is a process. It doesn't, so that's why I say you gotta be kind to yourself in your process of growth, because you're gonna have, know that you're a human. Know that you're gonna have moments of good days and bad days, hopefully intentionally more good than bad. You do that by serving others. Be of service to others, you have way more good days than bad. But um, I think, I think women, again, people are really just running from themselves and uh, refusing to accept some difficult truths and lying to, to themselves um, because that's what the ego does and that's what we do as a survival mechanism. Subconsciously, we lie to ourselves. Um, it destroys us, but we do it in order to survive because the ego is a tricky thing. It morphs into, separate, into whatever you need it for that moment, but it's, that's not really what it is. You know, it's like, it's like vegan burgers. It's like, that's a, that ain't a burger. It's not real, it tastes like a meat. It tastes like a burger, it's not a burger though. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
I think that's the issue, man. Like therapy, you know, like therapy's new in our community as far as it being a cultural conversation. That needs to play out some more. This this is new. Everybody ain't just healed. <laughs> like, so I think that has a lot to do with dating. Like date yourself first. For real though, that's not weird. It's not weird to date yourself. It's not weird to like, that's just treating yourself like the things that you would get to buy your own flowers. Why is that weird? Why does society tell you that buying your own flowers is weird if you like getting flowers, if they're beautiful to you? You know what I'm saying? Go see that movie by yourself if you want to see it. Don't wait on somebody to be available for you to live your life. I did that the other day. I went to the... To Damn, that's a bar. Don't wait on somebody available to live your life. Hold <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna pull my phone right, 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 right down. Because <laughs> yeah, like that's gonna it. lead into other... Yeah. It's like a web, you know? Like you have one thought and it's like... Then it springs out from there. Yeah, I do that shit all the time, man. Like I took myself to the movies the other day because it's like I'm working, 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 podcast, DJing, making I music, performing. Cool. Felt great. Like I do it, like, you know what? Because you know what it is? Because I'm around people, a lot of people all the time. Does, does that, what does that do to your energy, bro? Like, how do you, it, how do you maintain it, it, your it, own? It, it drains me. It drains, I don't know about other DJs, other entertainers. It drains me because I do it at a high level because I give it to the people. I'm yeah. like, I give all, you know, it's animated, it's, it's whatever it is. They Sacrifice yourself. It. Yeah, every night, you know. Beyond physically, like yourself. Yeah, man, and, and a lot of people, they don't understand that. They don't get it. And they, they don't get the fact that sometimes I need complete solitude. What do you, what does that look like for you? Like, what do you do specifically to one, recharge, to two, when you're in spaces that are draining how do you maintain or do you maintain or how do you manage the depletion right how do you manage what you give or like listen man sometimes like that's 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 a tough thing to what i normally do like on a monday i i won't really talk to anybody i won't return text messages i won't look at emails uh you know yeah i'll be on instagram but you know somebody will say something like oh you know, I, I hit you, you didn't hit me back, but I saw you post on Instagram. Oh, yeah, like because that. I don't need Hey, to. I don't like that, by the way. That thing that people feel a way about somebody being on IG, but like being able to text and, I mean, not text you back. That's, you gotta let people just live, man. We're not, we're not, we don't owe you, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like, yo, they don't, people don't understand that, man. It's like, and it's not even a, I could see how that could sound coming from us. So I wanna take it, I wanna, it's not like, you know, cause sometimes when people elevate, Oh, you're acting brand new. You're in Hollywood. It ain't none of that. It's like <laughs> this life comes with a lot and at a cost. If you don't understand that, it's because you're not contributing the necessary work within your craft and your purpose to know that you have to sacrifice yourself in order to be of purpose. Like, give me like I, I Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm giving myself like, let me get Monday for me. Can I have Monday for me? I almost want to ask people like, can can I just have one day for myself? Yeah. Can I, can you get me till tomorrow to get back to you? Can you get me till later tonight? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's never that, like, just give me one day and then tomorrow I'll be back giving myself to the world again and, and, and let's go, let's get back to it. But just give me today. So that me. one Monday kind of gets you. Kind of recharge the battery and, and refocus, recenter and, 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 you know, and continue on with the hustle come Tuesday morning. Yeah, you know? that's important, man. Yeah. I know like a lot of the people that I've been meeting um, they like I admire, you know, like these new people coming into my life. Um, they have something in common where they get away either quarterly, once a month, for a day, for two days. There's some folks that came out here this weekend for the birthday party um, for the day. They didn't even do any art Basel stuff. And they make sure that they <coughs> are intentional about. <laughs> those Mondays, <clears throat> excuse me, like those Mondays that you have, you know, like whether it's getting away somewhere, getting on a flight, finding a place within your city, a space within your house, honoring yourself in that way, man, you're a human. Your mind is more powerful than your body and it'll tell you that it can do more than it wants to do and it's good because that's what pushes you but you need to know when to listen to your body. The mind needs to know when to listen to the body and when to tell the body, nah, you got it, let's keep going. It's fine balance, but rest is equally as important even within working out as working out, as having a healthy diet. Sleep is equally part of that equation, man. But I thank you. I appreciate you. Brother.
this is uh this is therapeutic in a way in many ways you know what i mean and and Man, i'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to 2020 for you for your movement for what you're doing for how we can partner up and do some things together because i think uh I think you barely scratching the surface of, of the well, shit that you're about are. to do, man. Yeah.